invested in art. So many things going to market these days, you know, with high inflation, we're seeing the real estate market start to take a hit. But now this world of art, you know, recently Eddie Murphy just went viral here talking about he brought the original painting for the Good Times intro. And people were so shocked about how he paid, I want to say like one or two million dollars for it. And now it's worth 15 million dollars. So when this came across my desk. I had to take it. So with us live today, we got a very special guest, Miss Maria Brito. You guys and girls stay live today. Invest in art now. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and children, my ladies, you're now to the Investor Show. As always, this is your prince. This is your the prince of investment, Prince Dykes, coming to you guys and girls live all the way from the beautiful city and state of Denver, Colorado. You know, and we're via the lovely city and state of Honolulu, Hawaii, making this happen. As you guys saw earlier, I have a, I have a very special guest today, Miss Maria Berto. She is an alumni of Harvard, right? Um, Harvard. She was a lawyer. She's an attorney. Um, she worked in a corporate corporate law for a while before getting into art. So she got into interior design. Then once she got into interior design, she uh, designed for many notable, notable, notable celebrities that are out there. I know one of them was, um, I think it was Sean Puff, Eddie Combs, you know, to name many that she did out there in New York. But she got into art, art investing. She started to buy these little pieces as she was an attorney studying corporate law. So I found that very interesting, very intriguing, you know, to talk about a different style of investing, getting into the world of art. So without further ado, let me bring her in. She's all the way from New York City to this evening, if you're on the East Coast or Hawaii in the afternoon. But Miss Maria, how you doing today? Hi, Prince. I'm doing great. And thank you so much for this opportunity. I love your vibe and uh, thank you for the intro. And thank you everyone who's listening whatever you are all right look at she like to she likes to vibe okay that's good that's good so the first thing is i kind of give a little soft intro telling about how you became an attorney and you know being a harvard grad starting studying corporate law going into while you were studying corporate law buying you little pieces of fern not furniture but art and as you got into studying your art you went off and got into um interior design then got into art investing can you tell us a little bit of people, for people out there who are not aware of you, a little bit about yourself? Of course. I actually graduated from Harvard Law in year 2000, mm -hmm. and I moved to New York right away because it's the best place to be for any lawyer and anybody who wants to really start a career in business or banking. And so I wanted to work with corporations, and I specialized in corporate law because I thought it was the most interesting thing of businesses is knowing how the business operates from from the back of the contracts and all that. And uh, the, the truth is that I worked as a lawyer in a big law firm, in several law firms, but I ended in a big law firm. Um, and after nine years, I was like, this is not for me. It's just really not what I want to do. It's a very, very dry career, as you can imagine. The hours are endless. And it's not that I'm not a hard worker. It's just that I didn't get any satisfaction out of it. But in the meantime, I had started collecting art because living in New York City, you do have an advantage. You have a lot of galleries and you have the auction houses and you have a lot of collectors. So mind you, this was year 2000. When I moved to New York was in year 2000, but when I started my business was year 2009. Mm -hmm. And it was a very different art world back then because we didn't have Instagram because the things on the internet were not as easy to find. The galleries didn't have the websites they have nowadays. Things were more complicated. And so I started talking to people about this idea of living with art. It was a whole lot easier for me to transition as someone who was bringing a comprehensive service of design and art at the same time than just going straight to art. But with time, I realized that really my gifts and talents were streamlined much more towards teaching and helping my clients to spot opportunities in the art market, to 
by things that gain value over time. And at the same time, things that give them a lot of happiness and joy. You mentioned something very interesting, which is how Eddie Morphy bought Ernie Barnes before he was an expensive artist. And now everybody is after er whatever is left because Ernie Barnes is dead and he had a short career because before that he was a football player. So mm. there are many, many beautiful things about the art world. So basically, to make the very long story short, because it's been 14 years since then, is that I, as an entrepreneur, and many of the people who are listening know that when you are an entrepreneur and you run your own business, you have to reiterate many times and you have to do different things and to pivot and adjust. So the company became an art advisory business, which what I do is to support people in their endeavors of art collecting by pointing them to the right direction, by helping them sift through the massiveness that's available. New York City alone, Prince, has more than 1,000 art galleries. That's wow. just New York. And this is a global business. It's a 300 billion global business that it covers you know, the five continents, to be honest with you, because there are galleries in Morocco and Egypt, as you know, Asia is full of galleries and auction houses. You know, we have things happening in Australia and New Zealand. We have things happening all over the continent in America, from Canada to Argentina. And obviously, Europe was the pioneer of all this. So, you know, London, Paris, so everything in Switzerland also has a lot of galleries and secondary market, which is also so important, you know, because so many art collectors don't necessarily want to go and sell things at auction. So they look the help of people like me to broker those deals, which is, you know, filled with immense opportunity. So that's what I do. I help people gain value emotionally and financially through art. Now, that's great that you just spoke about, you know, I've, I want to say I have never gone to an art gallery and just walked around. I saw it so many times, but this is why what you're doing is so intriguing because I'm expanding my horizons, learning new things, seeing different things. How does someone start investing into art? Look, I think that the the key here is the same as if you were to invest in anything, right? Is to have education. Nobody in their right mind would just go and throw money at the stock market without really knowing what you're doing, right? I mean, unless you're playing as a very immature person, you're just gonna throw money at things there. So I hope that people are not doing that with a stock market or any market. So it takes time and it takes patience if you're gonna do it on your own because you have to get familiar with the conditions. You have to get familiar with what's relevant. People in my industry follow specialized news like Artnet or or Art News, and those are online, and you can start reading that. It's like it really sort of like builds up in real time. Every it, it's just a specialized, right? Like I mean, we get news every day, and so I recommend people getting education, getting into the websites of the big auction houses, for example, Sotheby's, Christie's, Phillips, because. It's not a good place for people to start buying, but it's a good place for people to start forming criteria around pricing and what's available. Remember that auction houses are really, I mean, they, they are the primary movers in what's public because what's everything that happens in galleries is never recorded for the public to know. So everything in this auction house is because it happens in an auction or it happens either on the website that people are also bidding you can always get the results and you can always see the prices. So while it is not all the market, it's the market that has at least the most transparency. So people should take a look at those things. It is a lot of, so many of them ask you to register, but that's, I mean, with no compromise, no commitment. All The only thing you have to do is to put on your email so that you can see the prices that everything that has been sold has fetched. So it's important to get education. It's important also, look, art fairs are a phenomena that has created a monster, if you will, because they multiply. So now there are fairs all over the world in, in the United States alone, we may probably have 
200 art fairs every year in different cities and different parts of the country. And so those are also places that people could visit without having to have any sort of like feelings of that people are watching them or that it is judgmental because usually they are very full of people and full of things too. So it's it's all about, it's, it's a very big place. It, the art market is very big. So I'm not gonna lie and say it's gonna be easy, but I'm saying if people wanna do it on their own, they have options to start educating themselves online from the comfort of their computers at home if they want to. And they can also move themselves and go to art fairs or art galleries and whatever it is. I mean, I would always recommend to go to art galleries in somehow bigger towns because they mm -hmm. get more variety of what's really representative of you know, the country at that particular time, right? Like, I mean, you don't want to see things that are only of your little town. You just want to see things that are happening that is relevant, right? I mean, the, the thing about artists is that they're always taking the pulse of the current conditions in society and speaking out loud about those things, right? It's not only something that is aesthetically exciting, but it's also something that has a lot of underlying information about where we are and this happens with any artist anywhere in the world because it's they are the custodians of culture and history okay um that was a now is art is this something that you would say to someone hey you need to be at a certain level to get at art and get into the art world like hey wait until you hit that status of you know maybe high network or this is just maybe just middle america could they go out and get a piece of art, you know? Yes. Well, what would you say about that? Well, here's the thing. It, it, it all depends on the objectives. Mm -hmm. I believe that if anybody wants to start collecting art and they have, you know, $10,000 to spend, mm -hmm. they can go to young art fairs that also have websites. For example, there is a very famous art fair called Spring Break, and they almost exclusively work with really young artists who are promising because it's they have a level of of curatorial selection so it's not just anybody or everybody so the, you can buy them online regardless of where you are the beauty of going in person is that you can interact with the artists and you can meet new people and they have one edition in new york and they want they have one edition in los angeles once a year but they, the website is up you know year round and so I would say, look, I mean, you have $10,000, let's say, and then you want to make two purchases a year, you can buy two things for 5000 and, you know, and then try next year again. Now, is that going to be the thing that's going to turn into a million dollars? I don't know, but it could be. I have known of several people who have bought things for $5,000 that have turned into 500,000 within the span of five years, because it's a very irrational market. But what you have to know is what you're buying and what you're buying, right? So quality is important to recognize. And that's why people hire me because mm -hmm. not necessarily everything has quality, not everything has the technique, you know, not everything has the you know, we also have to consider a lot of different factors. Who's this artist and will this artist go places? And is this artist ambitious? So if you want it for the pleasure and the fun, fine, no problem. If you want it with an intent of diversifying your wealth, then you probably will need either a lot of time on your own or a specialist like me. Consultant, okay. Now, what makes one artist painting worth more than another you know i let's say if i i don't know i went to the grocery store and saw a kid outside selling their painting and i purchased their painting versus if i went to let's say an art gallery or museum or event and i purchased a painting for 10 grand what makes a, a art painting gain value over time many different factors um it all depends really on the artist's ambition and the, the education of the artist. And the education doesn't necessarily mean an art degree. It means that the education of the artist with respect to who that artist is in the continuum, if that makes sense, right? I mean, like you don't start from scratch, you look back, mm 
you look at your place in society, in history, in this moment. So there are many, many things. Is this artist really committed? And are you going to invest in someone who's going to keep working until the end of their lives, right? Or is this someone who's just having a hobby, which in which case, prawn away, because you don't want to do that, right? Is this person a hustler? I mean, is he really knocking on doors in galleries, talking to people, asking, you know, for the right collectors? Or, I mean... I can tell you that maybe 11 years ago, this wasn't possible, but because of Instagram, that changed everything. Mm. So the access that the artists have and the access that the people who can find these artists have through technology is unprecedented in history. And I keep saying Instagram because TikTok is not where these people are. Maybe people who buy NFTs, maybe people who are playing in the digital world, maybe yes, they are there. But Instagram is the community where artists, galleries, collectors, museums, et cetera, are. So it it does take a little bit of research on the background of who this artist is. What is this artist telling us with the work? Is this artist invested in their career and going to be here for the long haul? Most artists can't really do anything else if it's such a vocation it's such a thing i mean if you tell beyonce if she's gonna like just quit tomorrow and go and be on a boat fishing i think it's gonna everybody's gonna tell me no she's not gonna do that right like artists who are visual artists are pretty much the same the only thing that fulfills their souls is being in their studios in front of a canvas or sculpting or photographing or whatever it is that they do. So I, uh, the question is very interesting, but it's not a very easy one to answer because it does have a lot of different factors to consider. Okay. Well, what we're going to do, you brought up a good point about, you know, about that, about the digital and the NFT world, stuff like that. But we're going to jump into that art versus stocks, art and NFTs, all this good stuff like when we get back from this break. So we're going to take a break, very quick break, you guys and girls. Hold on. We'll be back here with more of the Prince of Investment. back here live with the Prince of Investment coming to you guys and girls live all the way from the beautiful city and state of Denver, Colorado via the beautiful city and state of Honolulu, Hawaii. We're talking about art today. So we got our special guest, Miss Maria Brito, who is a art investor, art advisor and consultant who's been giving us so much knowledge so far. So Maria, here I am. I brought this piece of art. Um, I don't know, it's $10,000, $5,000, whatever. I brought this piece of art how do I know what his value is, let's say a year, two, three, four, five years from now? You should keep going back to the gallery. And that's why I don't recommend people buying things directly from artists, but buy it from a gallery or buy it from a reputable website like Artsy or Artnet or, uh, you know, all this new uh, you know, art space that dot com is another one. All these new iterations of marketplaces where people can actually acquire art. And the the highest benchmark for any art is once an artist has entered into 
the auction market. There are not only the three that I mentioned before, which are Christie's, Sotheby's, and Phillips. Those are the biggest ones. There is Bonhams and Swan and Heritage Hash. There are hundreds of auction houses in the United States. That is when something has entered into a secondary market like that, that kind. It means that, you know, the artist has a lot of potential value for the future. And, but, you know, once a gallery has worked with an artist, sold something to a collector, then they have to trace the value of the artist over time. And they have to hopefully keep working with the artist to represent the artist in the future, to show in the space, to connect that artist with museum curators. It is a very interesting relationship because nowadays artists have a lot of independence through the social media networks because people can come and buy directly from them. The thing is, it is it continues to be a very old school business. People, artists who went to school or even artists who didn't go to school but have a dream to show their paintings in a space that people go and interact with them in person, that, that dream never gets old. So mm. it requires physical spaces. Um, artists dream to be in museums and that doesn't ever go away, right? And so that's why keep an eye on reputable galleries, keep an eye of things that don't jump. If you are going to do this on your own, don't jump. Analyze what's happening in the market, analyze the galleries that are close to you and see what they're showing, what they're doing, ask questions. The world became very, very small with technology and shipping and logistics. And so you don't have to circumscribe yourself to the city where you are, the town where you are, you know, it's like, it's it's vast, but it's at the same time, sort of like small, the, the barriers are different. And at least in the 50 United States, you can have the advantage of having internal mechanisms to move a piece of art easier than if it were to be coming from Europe or Asia, for example. Okay, now when you look at the world of, let's say, the S and P five hundred, investing mm -hmm. in the stocks versus investing into art, how would you compare the two? Listen, that's an excellent question because in inflationary times where we are right now, the S and P five hundred would probably average a six percent return with good luck. <laughs> yeah, very good luck. <laughs> <laughs> the art market continues to return fourteen. 14%, okay? But that's knowing what you're doing. So I don't, you know, again, the stock market is a whole lot easier because it's something, if you're going to invest in S&P 500, you know that it has, it's an index. You know the companies that belong to that index. You can see them move in tandem because usually they do. And they have a re direct relationship to the economy in, in general, right? Inflation, interest rates, whatever the government says, it, every the macros of the economy impact the S&P 500 besides the company's decisions and however they're doing. Now, the art market, what it has is that when there is an incredible artist and an incredible piece of art, that's a unique asset. So the supply and the demand are mismatched, right? A lot of people may want that piece of art, but there is only one of that. Mm -hmm. So what that's the scarcity of the asset is what makes the art market resilient. But if anybody's considering an investment in the art market, they just have to be prepared and know what they're doing. And that that's why I, I have I keep saying this intentionally. You know, I mean it's not because they have to hire me, but it's because they don't, they shouldn't go without knowing what they're doing. Uh there is a company based in New York called Masterworks. Masterworks, for example, what they do is that they fractionalize our uh, shares, right? Like they, they, they buy assets, they buy great blue chip, important artists, dead and alive. And they turn those big paintings and big artists into fractionalized shares that they sell. And it's part of a fund. So, you know, people can, can come and buy two shares of a Picasso, let's say, and say, oh my God, I own this two shares. So that's like an interesting way for young people to, or people of any age, honestly, to get acquainted with this because the risk is not as high. 
and they can monitor different artworks if they want. I mean, they can buy two shares here, two shares there, you know. And so, I mean, it's a, it's a less risky thing than buying the art itself, but it's for a different type of, of investor too. I mean, there are people who might just be ready to do it there's like oh i have everything you know i have real estate i have S &P, i have you know stock i have That's bonds good. i have whatever and so i'm ready to start buying art where do i start so it's it's all about risk tolerance the desire also to own assets that are physical right i mean honestly at the end of the day they are pretty pretty low maintenance because you just hang them on your wall yeah sure you have to have insurance but i imagine that if you have a house with things inside your house you usually insure them. Um, <laughs> I, I hope um, the, the insurance for artwork is usually an extension of your home insurance. So it's not really that expensive or crazy. So, you know, at the end of the day, it is something that you love and love to look at. Um, you know, why not? Right. But again, this is all uh, in correlation to who is the investor, what are your risk tolerance levels, what do you really want to do with this? Okay. Well, I have the other question. You know, this new age, the new world, the cryptocurrency market, brought all these things called NFTs, you know, these non-fungible tokens that came along that people are selling their pictures and drawings are online and it has this value to it. How do you compare physical art to the new NFT market? They are two very different places and marketplaces. I think that a lot of people saw the NFTs as a way to acquire things where the barrier of entry is minimal, right? They don't really need to go physically to a gallery. They don't need to interact with anybody. Um, I have I have spoken with CEOs of technology companies who surprisingly have told me that they went into the NFT market because they felt intimidated in the art, mm -hmm. physical art world itself. I understand it, but I would never really understand that at the same time, because once you get into the art market and cross that door, you realize it's not as intimidating as you think. The um, NFTs are going to stay, but it's just going to be an extension of things, right? I mean, I don't think that anybody would want to have replaced the art on their walls with JPEGs on their computers, right? And also... Those assets are tied to crypto and, you know, it's different. They don't have the protection of a physical asset that is, you know, in the real world. So I just warn people also who want to go crazy into NFTs to also be cautious. A lot of crazy things have happened. You know, <laughs> people have been able to violate the security of the platforms. Things have occurred crypto the value of crypto really has gone to you know quite low mm -hmm. to say it elegantly so i think um it's a cute bet but i don't necessarily i mean i i see the value for people who just want to live in a digital world and that's okay i respect that it's just not going to replace the other world and right now, it is not something that I can recommend to anybody to go and invest in because it's too, it's, the volatility is not necessarily something for anybody to tolerate right now. Okay. Now, how creativity, your book, you released this 11 months ago, how creativity rules the world. Tell us about this book and where people can go get it. Thank you. Uh, well, so this book is a little bit of my adventures as an entrepreneur and how I transitioned from being a corporate attorney, which we started talking about, into the art advisor, collector, and consultant that I am today. So it is, um, it's published by HarperCollins. People can buy it at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. And uh, it's, uh, it's very cool because it really also talks a lot about the, the world of artists and the world of entrepreneurs and how both are so similar in their philosophies and how really people have it all backwards when they think artists are poor or starving. There's nothing furthest from the truth. So I hope that if anybody buys it, they enjoy it and they send me a message through mariabrito.com and they let me know what they think. 
Okay, well, I will put this out now for every, we're going to give out two copies here, the first two people to comment, uh, Maria, the first two people to comment, Maria, I'm going to send you two copies to you. Also, Maria, how can people find you? How can people contact with you, get in contact with you? Well, they can reach me at mariabrito.com, B-R-I-T-O.com. That's my website. And there is a form and you just fill it out and I that comes to us. And so we will be happy to respond. Okay. One last thing I want to get in here. So when Prince Dykes is ready to buy art, he goes, he gets Maria as his consultant. Maria takes him to art galleries, I'm guessing art fairs, some, something like that. And then I purchased my first piece of art. Well, I will be welcoming you with open arms. So okay. you just let me know. I'm here for you. Now, Maria, what about art museums? How do they play a role into this? Very important because it's the only legacy that an artist can hope for. The truth is right. I mean, like if I buy it, I will either donate it to a museum or I will give it to my kids so that my kids can pass it on, you know, like as a wealth protection, let's say. Mm. But the art museums are the custodians also of the future because they are established institutions. And we have we're very lucky that we do have many, many art museums in the United States. And we also have a lot of private museums. In other words, the ones that are not funded by the states and the federal government, but the ones from private individuals who have decided to create a building and put their art there for the world to enjoy. And so we do have a lot of that because as you know, the wealth creation in the United States in the past mm. 30 or 40 years has been absolutely insane in relationship to the rest of the world. And that includes obviously people in tech, people in banking, entrepreneurs, real estate, all sorts of things. So those people have acquired art and they have opened their private museums. And uh, when they do that, then there is a, let's say, a, a certainty that the art will be enjoyed by future generations and that they will take care of the legacy of their artist. It doesn't happen all the time. But it's one of the many other things that are important to to guarantee in a way that the artist will remain written in history. OK, now, one last thing I want to get into this, you, you hit on this generational wealth for my children and legacy. How does art fit into creating generational wealth to pass down? Well, look, I mean, it that's that's very important because, for example, the, the passing of the art will always be treated in the same way as any other asset, right? So when the art is passed down, there's not necessarily any sort of like, you know, uh, a special tax or any special sale that has to happen or anything like that. What happens, though, is that when you want to sell, you do have to pay capital gains, or you also have a very interesting way, which is to donate to museums, and then you have a hundred percent tax deduction, a hundred hmm. of the price that is at the time of the donation. So if I bought something for a hundred dollars and when I donate it is a million, I can write off a million dollars. But it, it has to go through obviously a specific type of appraisers and a want bunch of paperwork at the museum. It happens all the time. What I'm saying is not just any Joe Dick and Harry throws a piece of art at the door of the museum and says, please take this. No, it, it does have it does have something, right? Mm -hmm. I think that I mean, look, I have known plenty of people who have left art for their for their children and that has saved their family, right? Like, I mean, they, the kids end up selling it because they don't really, they don't have an affinity. They don't care, you know? And so they just sell it. Yeah, it happens, right? I mean, what I love, maybe my kids are not going to love. And, and that's it. But there has been a lot of families that have, not necessarily left a lot of cash for the kids, but they have left art. And that has really been a, a very important um, a piece of cash in the future for those people once they sell it. So it's an important, it's another asset that is to be considered for generational wealth, if that is something that, that people want to do. But, you know, 
it's one of the many other things. I think it's one to be considered amongst the packages. Okay. Well, definitely glad to have you on. Will you be back on? I will be. Definitely. We're definitely going to have you back on. Definitely. Thank you for stopping by. And the people who are tuning in, don't forget, check out her book, right? Check out her book. I'm going to give two of them away um, here. The first people, the first two people to comment, Maria, once I see it. And thank you for being on. Is there anything you want to leave the audience today? Now, well, you know, I'm, I'm very thankful for your time, friends, and for um, everybody in Hawaii as well. For, for providing the technology to do this. I'm happy to connect with anybody who's curious about this and serious, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, thank you. I mean, it's uh, wonderful to spend time with you all. All right. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, until the next video, podcast, book, cartoon, or whatever else is crazy that you see me doing around the globe, you already know my name is Prince Dykes. This is the Prince of Investment. Until the next video podcast, peace, be safe, I'm out, and thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, Please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.